Tim, and he does so much for the Clarence Brown Theater and for all of us. Uh, we're so fed by this theater community, and it's a joy to be here tonight. So I'm Missy Anderson. I'm the head of the English department. And as I told my panelists, don't worry, I'm not an AG scholar. I'm here as a fan. Uh, <laughs> he shows you the 18th century theater. So if you want to ask me hard questions about concrete, you can do that in the lobby here. We're um, here tonight um, to learn from and just have a great conversation with um, Michael LaFaro, who is a fantastic AG scholar. He's a professor of emeritus of English. Um, we also are uh, so fortunate to have our director here, Josh Rhodes, who is an absolutely brilliant choreographer. Um, his credits, by the way, include Dear World, Mac and Mabel, Grand Hotel, oh my goodness, so many fantastic shows that he has choreographed and has more recently um, become a film director as well. Uh, so we're, uh, we're just so lucky to have him here. Um, we also uh, have the incredibly gifted team of uh, Lynn Herons and Stephen Clary. Um, together, they have won Tony Awards, Drama Dusk Awards, Outer Circle Critic, uh, Outer Critic Circle Awards. Um, some of you may be familiar with one that uh, was the source of their Golden Globes for Anastasia the animated um, film that so many of you have seen. Um, but they also did the book, the music, and the lyrics for Once on This Island, um, which in its most recent uh, Broadway revival, 2018, won a Tony Grabass revival, and we at UT are especially proud of that one um, because our own Ashley Latimer, who graduated from the University of Tennessee with degrees in English and theater, no English and theater, <laughs> was part of the micro producer team um, for that production. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, just pass the mic around. I'm going to do a quick round on your relationship to the production, and then we'll come back to Dr. Lafaro for some background on the AG. So, first question to the None. <laughs> well, I did learn today that uh, my book has circulated a bit, which helped explain some things about the production for me and made it all the more interesting. So I was, I was delighted. We all, had, we all had a copy of that book when we were doing the, the world premiere show in, in Sarasota. Uh, it's a very heavy book. And <laughs> <laughs> the physical weight. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'm Stephen Flaherty. I am the composer of the musical Knoxville. I'm thrilled that we are here in Knoxville doing this piece about this particular place in this particular community. And uh, we had our first performance last night for the, for the people of Knoxville, and it was absolutely thrilling. So I'm delighted to be here uh, with my cohorts and we're, we're working with these wonderful artists. Uh, here at the Clarence Brown Theater. Yeah, hi, hi, hi. Thank you. Um, I'm Lynn Ahrens. I am the lyricist. Um, I've been working with Stephen Flaherty uh, on musicals, Broadway, off-Broadway, regional for more than 40 years. Um, and uh, every show that we do is, is a new life experience. And here we are in this beautiful city of Knoxville, working on a musical about Knoxville, written by someone who was born in Knoxville. Uh, but the, the circular quality uh, of this show goes round and round and, and keeps blowing our minds, to tell you the truth. But we're so happy to be here, and I hope you all come to see the show you know, during its run because it's about you and it's about this family of Knoxville and, and how that informs the main character in the show, who uh, is James the A.G. As, as a young boy, and how that the death in his family, his father's death, affects his whole life as a writer. And, you know, so we're very interested in that as writers and we're very interested um, in, you know, the, the, that topic and, and the topic of, of community. And um, anyway, so anyway, hope you all enjoy the show. But here we are to talk. So mm -hmm. that's great. Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Rhodes. I am the director of our for Knoxville. I was uh, brought into this by a beautiful, wonderful, amazing, smart, brilliant man named Fred Kalani. I had worked with him as a choreographer, 
And uh, even though I started to write some things on my own, he asked me if I would do this, and I said yes. Because when Frank calls, you say yes. <laughs> and, um, and dear Frank, uh, we, we lost him last year, and, um, and he asked me to take over the job of director. So that's what, that's why I am, I moved from core over to director, but we, um, we keep Frank very close to our hearts as we create the show. So it's been really special. He'd be so thrilled that we are here. I mean, I mean, and he'd probably say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, I'm going to pitch first to uh, Dr. Lafaro, and not just because he's my longtime colleague in the English department, um, but because he is the preeminent James E.G. scholar uh, living on the planet. I think that's where you say. <laughs> uh, he's the general editor uh, of the Meredith of the works of James E.G. He published um, seven volumes or editions about AG. And I wonder uh, if you could, Dr. Lafaro, just speak a little to the history around AG and the significance of, of death in the family, kind of ground us in that work. I'll help you do more. Okay. Did you want a little bit on AG first? Or? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to give you just a little bit on the life of James AG. I may be preaching to the choir here, so <laughs> smile at you Obviously, we're here because of his Pulitzer Prize winning book, A Death in the Family. Uh, but he's also very well known for Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. <clears throat> and, uh, you can't neglect one for the other, is my way of thinking. And the problem with aging for me is he's such a dang prolific. Uh, observer, an acute observer of American culture, that he's everywhere that you look in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So I wanted to give you a little tiptoe through some of his tulips, just as a reminder. Um, he was a poet, a novelist, a journalist, an essayist, uh, literally Chuck, you are, there you are, film critic, film reviewer, film essayist, and a screenplay writer, uh, among other things. And just to, to start off with the earliest one, uh, this Harvard alone won the Yale Prize for Younger Poets at the age <laughs> of 25, which wasn't a bad thing to do. And that was for Permit Me Voyage. The title of his collection, Creeps from Heart Crane's poem. Uh, he had had a job already working at Fortune magazine. It was a wild thing because they wanted literary people and they figured they could, Henry Lewis figured they could teach them business easier than they could teach business reporters to be literate. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he got in. Um, they gave a typical 30s assignment. Y'all go down south. You go down south there, Alabama, and do us an expose of sheer crime. Well, AGS sometimes was his one. He brought back something that was totally unusable for a financial magazine. So he just, well, he took five years and developed it into Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Uh, and the interesting thing about it, he talked about the myriad mindedness of aging many times. That's David Matten's phrase. Um, you know how this thing was cataloged? Back then, we were on the Dewey Decimal System from the our libraries. I just have to read it out to you sociology, literature, photojournalism, history, philosophy, music, and of course, agriculture. <laughs> AG has many audiences, obviously. As a journalist, though, uh, he was singularly uh, forthright and incisive. I wanted just to read you one little tiny excerpt from the lead piece in time that he wrote on the dropping of the atomic bomb. 
which was on, the, the issue was August 20th, 45. Crazy really did change the world. He wrote, quote, the promise of good and evil bordered alike upon the incident, with this further terrible split in the facts that upon a people already so nearly drowned in materialism, even in peacetime, the good uses of this power might bring disaster as prodigious as the evil. I think that's why Paul Ashdown, our old colleague, uh, called him the prophet of Highland Avenue. Uh, KJ had begun his film reviewing career in 41 uh, for Time, The Nation, and other magazines. And W.H. Horton applauded the Dickens at him. It's a well known quote, I won't give it to you here. But I did want to remind you that he also wrote for Life magazine, did two of the best film essays I've ever read. The first one was his rejuvenation of silent film comedy called Comedy's Greatest Era in 1949. Not did he bring back an appreciation for that, but he brought back the careers of Charlie Chaplin, Harry Langdon, Harold Lloyd, and Buster Keaton. The next year for life, he did one on his friend and established John Huston's uh, genius behind the camera in a piece wonderfully termed Undirectable Direct. <laughs> he made it to Hollywood, a standard place for these critics to go and literary folk of the day. He worked with Hyden and Hartford doing Stephen Crane short stories. He did the Blue Hotel and the Bright Coast, the Yellowstone. And that's before he actually won the Academy Award not, not, nomination, excuse me, for a uh, best screenplay uh, for is what? John Houston's The African Queen. Uh, he then proceeded for his next major film, to my way of thinking, uh, to work with Charles Lawton on the only film Charles Lawton ever directed, and that was The Night of the Hunter. And if you've never seen that terrifying original black and white film with Robert Mitchell with love and hate tattooed on his phony creature knuckles, uh, Give it a look. <laughs> and one last thing I just wanted to mention as an aside, really, he did the first television miniseries. Five television screenplays for an adaptation of Carl Sandberg's Mr. Lincoln. And he did it for Omnibus in 52 and 53. So quite clearly for me, at least, no other writer really scrutinized American culture at that time, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, from as many perspectives and in as many forms as James Agee did, and you did it as well. Thank you very much.